Good morning. Come on in out of the rain. Welcome to Duck. We're so glad that you're here. Has it started raining outside? Oh. Well, we're just so glad that you came out on a rainy Sunday morning to worship Jesus with us. Just curious, um, do we have any visitors with us? Any folks that might be visiting with us today? Okay. All right. Well, I tell you what, let's just all join together. Let's stand and we're going to lift our voices to the Lord in song. Get off me, devil, don't need your trouble. I know you come like a thief in the night. I got the good news, and I'm here to tell you, you're never going to win this fight. My God is undefeated. Oh, you can't hold me down You'll never steal my joy No, the grave has been destroyed yeah. You can't hold me down Let's sing it Oh, yeah, na, 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 na Oh, yeah, na, 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 na Oh, yeah, you can't hold me down Get under my feet, your lies are so weak, and I'm never gonna run and hide. Dressed in the armor of God my Father, oh, and he's fighting for his child. My God is undefeated, love is what my free. You can't hold me down Oh, you'll never steal my joy No, the grave has been destroyed, yeah You can't hold me down Oh, yeah, na, 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 na Oh, yeah, na, 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 na Oh, yeah, you can't hold me down Oh, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Yeah, disgrace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Oh, yeah. Too high. 
But chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have no future, my eyes are open. Cause when you call me, Amen, amen. Y'all can take a seat for a second. So if I go to the Gospel of Mark, 9, 2 through 3, it says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain, apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining and exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth could whiten them. You know, the miracle of the transfiguration, it wasn't that Jesus shined like the sun. The miracle was that he didn't shine like the sun all the time. See, when Jesus came to earth, he never gave up his deity, but we might say that he shrouded his glory and laid aside the privileges of his deity. You see, Jesus Christ is God. He's a member of the Trinity, co-equal and co-eternal with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. Jesus was God before he was born, and he remained God after he became man. His deity was pre-human, pre-Mary, pre-Bethlehem. See, Jesus laid aside not his deity, but the privileges of deity to model what it is to be a servant. So we're to follow his example. If Jesus could lay aside the privileges of divinity, then how much more should we 
as human beings with sinful hearts, be willing to put the needs of others above ourselves. It's not easy. In fact, we could say it's virtually impossible. Impossible apart from the power of the Spirit. Christ himself living in us and giving us his love and power. It's the only way we can put needs of another person above our own. To love people whom we really don't like that much. It may seem impossible, but like it or not, this is the way God has called us to live. So if Christ is our foundation, our cornerstone, it's time that we get on board or find ourselves in sinking sand. Let us pray. Jesus, we come here today humble sinners. Lord, we pray that we, live, we will leave here today filled with the Holy Spirit in your presence that we might be able to reach out to others and to love them like we've never loved anyone before. Just the way that Jesus loved us when he came to earth and rose from the dead. And it's in the powerful name of Jesus that we lift our hearts in prayer today. Amen. Let's all stand and sing Cornerstone. Shall 
come with trumpet sound And oh may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Fall is stand before the throne If you could take just a moment and greet somebody near you and pass the peace and tell them, welcome to Duck. Don't be afraid to cross the aisles. It's not lava. some fun together because February on the Outer Banks can be a little depressing, right? Mm -hmm. So we like to get together and just have some joy. So if you want to learn to cook some Greek food or make little quilt squares or design your own journal for like a prayer journal or something like that, um, you can go to the fellowship hall and sign up to do that stuff as well um, and join in on all the fun. Um, kids, children's sermon time, come on up.
No. No milk and bread at your house. What about your house? Milk toast. Milk toast. <laughs> Anybody leave there? Um, did you have to turn the faucets on so your pipes wouldn't freeze? Anybody do that? You have your pipes freeze at your house? Good. <laughs> well, um, Scripture tells us that when storms come in our life, we should be prepared for them and expect that they're going to come. One of the ways that we can be prepared for storms when they come is to be here and worship on a regular basis and to connect with God and to connect with other people in our church to help us when the cult time comes. So that is my little message for you all this morning. Can I pray for you? Is that cool? Yeah. All right. Let's pray. Yeah. Thank you for these boys and girls and ask that your Holy Spirit would fill them that they might know you more deeply and when they face storms in their lives, pray that they would be prepared because they know you. Amen. All right. We'll see what kind of candy Pastor John has here. Some dum dums and starbursts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do I have the right kind of starburst? No. What are the right kind? Red. Red? There's a red one. Oh, it might, it's not the right kind. morning. It's not really a mission. It's a, a video update from our finance chair, uh, Lynn Usher, and he's going to share with you a little bit about uh, the great news that we have at the end of 2017 about all the ways that God has provided for us. So uh, take a look and uh, enjoy the celebration of it all. As chairman of the finance committee, I'd like to take this opportunity to provide a quick update on our financial condition as we enter 2018. The key points are first, and we ought to remind ourselves of this often, we have no debt. Second, offering contributions in 2017 exceeded expenses both because of the strong giving as well as successful efforts by the Board of Trustees to plan for and invest in preventative maintenance. Third, We entered the new budget year on January 1 with an available balance of $119,000 after allocating funds for the emergency reserve fund and ensuring that contributions designated for scholarships, local ministries, ZOE, and other programs have been set aside. I'll show you a couple charts that will provide further information about this. The first chart compares cumulative contributions to the general offering by month for 2017 and each of the five preceding years. The red line shows that the level of giving year to date for each month in 2017 exceeded all previous years. Giving in December was particularly strong, marking the first month in which total offering contributions exceeded $100,000. Also, six of the 10 highest monthly totals since 2012 occurred in 2017. In addition to an improving economy, the increased level of giving can be traced directly to the stewardship program that began in 2016. The second chart shows a shift in our congregation's pattern of giving in recent years. This chart shows the percentage of total annual contributions in each quarter of the fiscal year. Prior to 2014, we contributed roughly one-fourth of the yearly total in each quarter. In recent years, however, we have received a lower percentage of total contributions in the first quarter, January to March, and a considerably higher percentage in the fourth quarter, October to December. In fact, in 2017, fully one-third of the year's contributions were made in the fourth quarter. Although those of us on the Finance Committee are on pins and needles as December approaches, we remind ourselves of the generosity that the members and friends of Duck Church have shown over the years. We very much appreciate your support. That's some really good news, right? We are financially secure at Duck Church, and God has provided over and above our expectations. We thank you for the ways that you've allowed God to speak to your heart when we called on you in the stewardship campaign to consider what God would have you to give, that you um, allowed the Holy Spirit to speak to you and you've given generously and faithfully. So thank you for allowing God to use you. And now, uh, would the ushers come forward as we receive God's tithes and offerings?
cry You answer me From where the thunder lies And I run This heart I'm tethered to With every step I collide with you Like a tidal wave Crashing over me Rushing in said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and started out. As they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. 
But soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water, and they were in real danger. The disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. So when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the storm and the raging waves, and suddenly the storm stopped and all was calm. Then he asked them, Where is your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed. Who is this man, they asked each other. When he gives a command, even the wind and the waves obey him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I'm also going to read to you from <clears throat> Peter's first letter uh, in chapter 4, starting with verse 12. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. Amen. So, um, <clears throat> this message, just so you're fully aware, full disclosure, um, was supposed to be a message for our youth group on January 7th. Uh, we did not have church or youth group that Sunday, and so I decided um, that we could recycle it a little bit, um, and it has become more and more relevant in my life as the month has gone on. Um, we're doing a series about storms in our youth group. Uh, we've had two snowstorms, uh, and then this, or I guess it was last evening about 10 o'clock, um, I go to turn on the water in the tap, and there is nothing, like zero water. I'm like, it was 60 degrees yesterday, or like, you know, it was 60 degrees all day. There's no way the pipes are frozen. What in the world has happened? We have no idea what's going on, except that perhaps this is just an opportunity for God to give us a new object lesson for our sermon today about storms. Uh, when we don't know um, what's going to happen, when the unexpected happens, that uh, we have, um, I guess, responsibility to decide how we're going to respond to that kind of thing. So, um, this morning, I ended up here at about 7 o'clock. I was really grateful for the shower that we have next to the kitchen. Um, and John Park is at my house currently trying to talk to the water people <laughs> and see if we can get some water at our house before this afternoon is out. Um, but I had no idea that that was going to happen last night before we got here this morning. Uh, and that's kind of how uh, storms are, right? They sort of come up on us unexpected. Um, it happened with the snowstorms we've had in the last couple of weeks. I don't think ever on the Outer Banks that we're prepared for snow. We are not prepared for snow. Um, the proof is in how many snow plows we actually have on the Outer Banks, right? Uh, we have maybe one truck that can go out and put the um, saline solution, I guess, the salt stuff all over the roads, and, uh, and we just kind of hope for the best. And then uh, we can maybe get a snow plow out, but if there's ice underneath the snow like there was with that first storm, we're just kind of in it, you know, we're going to be stuck in this for a while. So um, the way that I found myself on, uh, I guess it was the beginning of January, um, I was here at church on a Wednesday afternoon, we heard that the storm was going to come, and so I decided that I was going to go by Food Lion to go get, what do you get before a storm? Bread and milk, okay, yep. So we were out of bread and milk at my house. Um, and I figured, you know, if it was just me and just Jason, we would probably be okay. But with James, we have to have peanut butter and honey sandwiches available at all times. Um, and he needs his milk. So I decided to brave the food lion in Southern Shores with the rest of Southern Shores. And Corolla, probably. And Kitty Hawk. It was like everyone had descended upon the food lion to get the manna that God had dropped from heaven in the form of bread and milk. Um, and they had enough supply. There wasn't an issue with that. Uh, they just didn't have enough cashiers to deal with all this. So we were standing in line for about 15, 20 minutes to buy our uh, bread and our milk. And we were able to get it. And I got home. And then we just hunkered down for the storm, hoping that things were going to be okay. And I don't think any of us realized that we were going to be stuck inside for four whole days. And if any of you have children, um, and they were sort of starting to bounce off the walls, that's kind of what was happening at my house. James can only handle about 15 minutes out in the snow, because, uh, you know, the gloves that they make for, like, 
tiny people, like they have zero insulation. <laughs> so as soon as he puts his hands down in the snow, like it was a lost cause and we had to get him inside. So here we are in the midst of this storm, trying to figure out what in the world that we're going to do. Really glad that we have some bread and milk and that we prepared ahead of time. But in my boredom, I found myself probably like a lot of you on Facebook, a lot. Uh, just kind of running through my feed, seeing what people were doing. Maybe they were having some fun. Maybe they had a funny story to tell or something like that. And uh, one of my friends who's a pastor down in Nags Head, uh, he has a set of twins who are like 9 or 10 years old, and then a 14-year-old boy who you know eats a ton, um, and then himself and his wife. And so every day he would sort of post the countdown of what was left in his pantry and refrigerator. And so by day four, he had a pack of chicken, and he had a sack of potatoes. And he said, I don't really know what I'm going to make with this, but this is all we've got left. If we have to do any more than this, we're just going to be uh, doing subsistence living on potato chips. Uh, so thankfully, he was able to get out the next day, but, you know, he wasn't quite prepared for the storm. And I don't think I was quite prepared to spend four days in my house uh, with my two-year-old, um, and I was glad when I was able to get out. But then... Two weeks later, right, we get another storm. And so, you know, we're looking at the forecast, trying to uh, see what's going to happen. I got a little excited that there was going to be snow because we had a ski retreat last weekend. And if it's snowing here, for certain it's snowing in the Virginia mountains. So I was really excited about that. So uh, the way that I check the weather um, is sometimes I'll check Weather Channel. But really, most of the time, I just call my parents in Raleigh. And I expect that you know, in four hours, we're going to experience whatever they've experienced in Raleigh, right? I mean, that's pretty logical, um, but apparently Raleigh has this, like, halo around them where they don't get the effect of storms that other people see. You can see satellite images of this kind of thing, uh, but my dad had said there had been about four inches of snow, so I thought, okay, we'll have four inches of snow, then it'll all melt the next day. It'll be just fine. Um, I don't know about your house, because it seems like the totals were different all over the Outer Banks, but I think we had about 10 inches of snow at my house, and I don't think it was a snow drift. I think that was legitimately 10 inches of snow. I haven't seen 10 inches of snow since I was in high school. Like, that's how often this happens in North Carolina. North Carolina girls are not used to having snow on a regular basis, and so uh, I hadn't gone to the store because, of course, I was planning to go out of town, for the ski trip, and I thought, well, whatever food that we have in the refrigerator, we'll just be able to eat through it, and we'll be just fine. But having 10 inches of snow, my first thought was snow cream, right? Any snow cream lovers out there? Yes. So I knew that I had already used uh, the can of sweetened condensed milk that I had bought the previous snowstorm. So I looked through my pantry just in hopes that there's something hidden in the depths, you know, so I had to get up on a stool, stand up, kind of peer through and see what I had, and I saw the evaporated milk, I'm like, no, that's not it. And then I found some sweetened condensed milk that was one year out of date. So I wasn't going to be using that to make snow cream out of the best snow that we've had on the Outer Banks since I've lived here for 11 years. Um, and so I just, I wasn't prepared for this storm. I wasn't prepared to be able to deal with it. Uh, thankfully, Jason's cousins bailed us out. They had some coconut milk evaporated sweetened condensed milk thing. Have you ever heard of that? Coconut milk sweetened condensed milk. It was really good. Like, tastes like coconut, and then you put some dark chocolate syrup on top of it. There's your recipe for Tuesday when it's supposed to snow again. Did you know that? It's supposed to snow again on Tuesday. Wintry mix. That's the worst kind of snow. So, um, as all these storms have come and I've just been thinking about, am I prepared for the next storm that's going to come? Um, I've been thinking about uh, the storms that we face in our life and whether or not I'm prepared to face those storms. The passage in 1 Peter said that we shouldn't be surprised when we face storms as if it was something strange that's happening to us. Uh, Peter is saying that storms are a normal part of life, and sometimes we like to pretend and put our blinders on that Life is great, we're going to be super optimistic, and if we're really optimistic, then we're not going to face any difficulties in our life. But that's not true. We know that there are going to be hard times that come up in our life. And we don't necessarily know what those hard times are going to look like, but we know that they're going to come. 
And the question becomes for us, are we prepared to be able to deal with those storms when they come? Or are we going to be caught like some people were a couple weeks ago with frozen pipes because we didn't leave the faucet dripping? And so uh, this morning, I just wanted to give you all a couple of tools, a couple of ways that you can prepare yourself uh, when uh, life's storms come. Um, And so there's a couple of things I wanted to share with you. Um, We need to be investing in some relationships before storms come in our life. And the first relationship, the most important relationship, is to be investing in our relationship with God. I know that um, it's kind of typical, I think, for most of us that when we go through difficult times in our life, the quantity of prayers in our life increase. So like as storms in our life rise, so does the amount of praying and Bible reading that we do, which is great. God loves it when we come to him um, with our troubles and with our issues. He loves it when we share the things that are going on in our lives that are difficult. But I want to suggest to you that uh, we need to be preparing uh, in our relationship with the Lord before a storm even comes. Um, There's uh, been some studies recently about teenagers and uh, the ways that they tend to walk away from their faith. Um, And for those kids who tend to walk away from their faith in uh, high school and young adulthood, a lot of them have experienced a traumatic time in their life or a really difficult time, a trial. And they didn't have the spiritual maturity, the roots, if you will, in their relationship with God to be able to weather the storm. Um, And so a lot of young people, because they're not as mature in their faith, they don't have as many life experiences, they don't have as many experiences with God, they uh, find themselves floundering when a difficult time comes instead of leaning into their relationship with God. And one of the ways that we can help our young people and help ourselves weather storms is by being connected with God on a regular basis. Uh, Pastor John talks about this all the time. I talk about this all the time, uh, that we need to have a regular habit in our lives of spending time in God's Word and spending time in prayer. And if we develop that habit over the course of time, our relationship with God develops a kind of depth and a kind of trust that can only happen over a long-term relationship. If we just expect God to show up when a crisis comes, we're not going to have a depth of relationship and really a trust in God to be able to weather life's storms. And so I want to encourage you um, to to make time uh, to spend time with God on a regular basis, both in prayer and in the Word. Uh, And then I also want to share this with you. If you've got a bulletin, um, there's an insert in your bulletin with, Um, This thing that says Bible verses for facing storms. Does anybody not have a bulletin and they need one of these handouts? You can raise your hand. John's back there. He can hook you up. Y'all are all good churchgoers. There's some right there, by the way. Um, So this sheet right here is something uh, that I typically share with folks who are in the middle of a crisis. Uh, If somebody comes to me, either a teenager, adult, parent, whoever it is, they're going through a crisis and they say, Amy, what does the Bible say about this? I have this saved as a document on my computer, and I print it out, and I send it to them um, as a way of helping them to see what God's Word says about dealing with storms. And it's just a list of God's promises for us. Um, And I encourage you to not use this as a um, crisis intervention method in your life, but if you don't have a regular time with the Lord, or even if you do, I encourage you to meditate on these verses uh, to allow God to begin... um, putting them in your heart so that when a crisis comes, when you're facing a storm, that God is able to speak to you from that well of scripture that's hidden in your heart, and he can tell you when you're lonely that he will never leave you or forsake you because you've memorized that and you've meditated on that truth. He can uh, let you know that when your plans don't work out and your life seems to be falling apart, that he has a purpose for you that is good and it is not to harm you. He can remind you that he is the God of all comfort, and he longs for you to come to him and to hand over your worries and your cares to him because he cares for you. So I encourage you to put this in your Bible, um, to meditate on these verses, um, and to think through them and allow God to, uh, to show you the kind of trustworthy God that he is. Um, if you flip over on the other side of the sheet, um, it's important 
while it's important also to uh, have a relationship with God that has some depth to it, I encourage you um, in advance of any storms coming in your life that you think about who are the people in your life that can support you if you're going through a difficult time? Who are the people who can walk with you through a storm? And who are the people who are going to point you to God? And these are the kind of people that can listen to you without, like, standing up and running away real quick to do something else. These are people who can give you godly wisdom and help you to reconnect with God if you feel distant from him. Or if it doesn't feel like God's promises are true, they can remind you that God's promises are still true. So I want to encourage you just for a second to take a minute. There's some pencils on the back of your pew um, to think about who are some emergency contacts for you uh, when it comes to your spiritual life. Parents, you know that when kids are enrolling in school or when they're starting the new school year, you have to fill out a whole bunch of paperwork, and one of the things you have to do is to fill out the emergency contact sheet. And there's need to be people that you trust, people that your child trusts, um, people that you can go to in the case of an emergency. And so let me uh, give you just a minute here. Uh, think about who are maybe three people who you can count on to point you to God in the midst of the storm. Go ahead and do that. As you're finishing that up, I just want to remind you that our church has Stephen ministers. Stephen ministers are folks who've received uh, 50 hours of training to be able to care for folks when they're going through difficult times. We have at least a dozen. I'm not sure how many we actually have. Is that right, Christy? Close? Yeah. Something like that. Um, of folks who are available to minister to you. Um, so if you ever find yourself in the midst of the storm and you want someone that you can talk to, uh, you can get in touch with myself, Pastor John, or either the Stephen leaders, uh, Tom Davidson or Lynn Blackburn, and contact them. Um, everything that you share with your Stephen minister is absolutely confidential. I don't even know who has a Stephen minister when they have one. It's that confidential. Um, even if I refer someone, I don't know if they ever take me up on it or anything like that. So um, know that if you are ever in a crisis, that there are people in our church who are trained to help you deal with that crisis. <clears throat> Lastly, I uh, want to remind you of something you already know, which is that when you go through difficult times, those are the times in your life where you're going to experience the most growth in your relationship with God and as a person. Um, it says in Scripture that when we go through difficult times, that it's like a refining process where God strips away the impurities and all that's left is the pure stuff says in James that uh, when we face trials, we should consider it joy because those trials produce faith, and that faith produces perseverance, and that perseverance brings us to maturity. Um, in our passage this morning from 1 Peter, it says that when we experience suffering, we become partners with Christ in his suffering. We become partners with Christ in his suffering. That doesn't mean that you're going to, like, be nailed to a cross one day. Uh, what it means is that when we experience suffering, Christ has experienced that suffering along with us. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In Isaiah 53, um, it talks about the Messiah who is to come 800 years before Jesus ever came to earth. And it says that the Messiah is going to be a suffering servant, or he's called the man of sorrows, who is familiar with grief. Uh, we don't have a God who is far removed from us, who's up in heaven and doesn't know what it's like to live here on earth. We have a God, as Barry said, who became man uh, and has experienced every bit of what we experience life. He knows hardship. He knows what it's like to be in physical pain. Um, he's experienced temptation. He's experienced loneliness. And uh, he understands what it's like to be human and to go through trials. But more than that, it goes on in Isaiah 53 to say that the man of sorrows would, 
carry our sins and our sorrows. And so when we see Jesus on a cross, we're not just celebrating the fact that we can be forgiven. We're celebrating the fact that everything that we've gone through that has been difficult, Jesus has physically already borne that on his body. And he has carried that with us. And so he knows exactly what it feels like to go through what you have gone through. Exactly what it feels like because he's carried that for you and with you. And so I encourage you as you start to process uh, your storms, sometimes that's kind of a cleanup process. Uh, like we have after hurricanes, the storm comes through and then you have to start the cleanup process. And sometimes as you start that process, you start to wonder uh, what in the world has happened? What's going to happen from here on out? And uh, this is a time for you to process how God is going to help you grow in your weakness. Um, it's kind of like a broken bone. If you've ever had a broken bone before, you know that that part of your body has totally become weak now, right? And it's inusable. And so all of a sudden you find yourself incapable of doing the things that you had been doing before because you're incapacitated. And, but then if you go to a doctor and you ask the doctor to heal you, the doctor is able to set your arm back straight or whatever uh, bone that you've broken. And then after it gets set straight, then the bone, it's crazy how this happens, isn't it? Your bone starts to grow back together. How awesome is that? So you're, as your bone starts to grow back together, the place where it was broken, instead of being your place of weakness, actually becomes a stronger piece of bone than it was before. And so when we go through difficult times in our life, we might feel we're at our greatest weakness, that we're just crippled and we can't stand under it. But if we go to God, who is the cure giver, who is the healer, and we ask him to set us straight and to start the healing process, after time passes a little while, God can make the parts of our lives that were the weakest, the places of our greatest strength. And that's an incredible incredible blessing but you can't get there without going through the storm so I just want to ask you as I'm closing up are you prepared are you ready if a storm would come today tomorrow or later on and my prayer is that as you develop your relationship with the Lord as you develop relationships with one another here that you would find that you are prepared because God has given you the strength so, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Y'all would go ahead and stand up. Let's join together.
wonderful, you are wonderful, oh God. There is no one more wonderful, you are wonderful, God, you are the most wonderful. You are glorious. Amen. Amen. 